Part One of The Lees of Happiness. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Laurie Ann Walden. The Lees of Happiness by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Part One. Introduction. Of this story, I can say that it came to me in an irresistible form, crying to be written. It will be accused, perhaps, of being a mere piece of sentimentality, but, as I saw it, it was a great deal more. If, therefore, it lacks the ring of sincerity, or even of tragedy, the fault rests not with the theme, but with my handling of it. It appeared in the Chicago Tribune, and later obtained, I believe, the quadruple gold laurel leaf, or some such encomium, from one of the anthologists, who at present swarm among us. The gentleman I refer to runs, as a rule, to stark melodramas with a volcano, or the ghost of John Paul Jones in the role of nemesis, melodramas carefully disguised by early paragraphs in Jamesian manner, which hint dark and subtle complexities to follow, on this order. The case of Shaw McPhee, curiously enough, had no bearing on the almost incredible attitude of Martin Sulo. This is parenthetical, and, to at least three observers, whose names for the present I must conceal, it seems improbable, etc., 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 until the poor rat of fiction is at least forced out into the open, and the melodrama begins. End of the introduction. The Lees of Happiness if you should look through the files of old magazines for the first years of the present century, you would find, sandwiched in between the stories of Richard Harding Davis and Frank Norris and others long since dead, the work of one Geoffrey Curtin, a novel or two, and perhaps three or four dozen short stories. You could, if you were interested, follow them along until, say, 1908, when they suddenly disappeared. When you had read them all, you would have been quite sure that here were no masterpieces. Here were passably amusing stories, a bit out of date now, but doubtless the sort that would then have whiled away a dreary half-hour in a dental office. The man who did them was of good intelligence, talented, glib, probably young. In the samples of his work you found, there would have been nothing to stir you to more than a faint interest in the whims of life, no deep interior laughs, no sense of futility or hint of tragedy. After reading them, you would yawn and put the number back in the files, and perhaps, if you were in some library reading room, you would decide that by way of variety you would look at a newspaper of the period and see whether the Japs had taken Port Arthur. But if by any chance the newspaper you had chosen was the right one and had crackled open at the theatrical page, your eyes would have been arrested and held and for at least a minute you would have forgotten Port Arthur as quickly as you forgot Chateau Thierry. For you would, by this fortunate chance, be looking at the portrait of an exquisite woman. Those were the days of Floradora and of sextets, of pinched-in waists and blown-out sleeves, of almost bustles and absolute ballet skirts. But here, without doubt, disguised as she might be by the unaccustomed stiffness and old fashion of her costume, was a butterfly of butterflies. Here was the gaiety of the period, the soft wine of eyes, the songs that flurried hearts, the toasts and the bouquets, the dances and the dinners. Here was a Venus of the handsome cab, the Gibson girl in her glorious prime. Here was... Here was, you find by looking at the name beneath, one Roxanne Milbank, who had been chorus girl and understudy in The Daisy Chain, but who, by reason of an excellent performance when the star was indisposed, had gained a leading part. You would look again, and wonder, why you had never heard of her? Why did her name not linger in popular songs and vaudeville jokes and cigar bands, and the memory of that gay old uncle of yours, along with Lillian Russell and Stella Mayhew and Anna Held? Roxanne Milbank, whither had she gone? What dark trapdoor had opened suddenly and swallowed her up? Her name was certainly not in last Sunday's supplement on that list of actresses married to English noblemen. No doubt she was dead, poor beautiful young lady, and quite forgotten. I am hoping too much. I am having you stumble on Geoffrey Curtin's stories in Roxanne Milbank's picture. 
It would be incredible that you should find a newspaper item six months later, a single item two inches by four, which informed the public of the marriage, very quietly, of Miss Roxanne Milbank, who had been on tour with The Daisy Chain, to Mr. Geoffrey Curtin, the popular author. Mrs. Curtin, it added dispassionately, will retire from the stage. It was a marriage of love. He was sufficiently spoiled to be charming. She was ingenuous enough to be irresistible. Like two floating logs they met in a head-on rush, caught and sped along together. Yet had Geoffrey Curtin kept at scrivening for two score years, he could not have put a quirk into one of his stories weirder than the quirk that came into his own life. Had Roxanne Milbank played three dozen parts and filled five thousand houses, she could never have had a role with more happiness and more despair than were in the fate prepared for Roxanne Curtin. For a year they lived in hotels, traveled to California, to Alaska, to Florida, to Mexico, loved and quarreled gently, and gloried in the golden triflings of his wit with her beauty. They were young and gravely passionate. They demanded everything, and then yielded everything again in ecstasies of unselfishness and pride. She loved the swift tones of his voice and his frantic, unfounded jealousy. He loved her dark radiance, the white irises of her eyes, the warm, lustrous enthusiasm of her smile. "'Don't you like her?' he would demand, rather excitedly and shyly. "'Isn't she wonderful?' Did you ever see? Yes, they would answer, grinning. She's a wonder. You're lucky. The year passed. They tired of hotels. They bought an old house in twenty acres near the town of Marlowe, half an hour from Chicago. Bought a little car and moved out riotously with a pioneering hallucination that would have confounded Balboa. Your room will be here, they cried in turn. And then and my room here, and the nursery here when we have children, and we'll build a sleeping porch, oh, next year. They moved out in April. In July, Geoffrey's closest friend, Harry Cromwell, came to spend a week. They met him at the end of the long lawn and hurried him proudly to the house. Harry was married also. His wife had had a baby some six months before and was still recuperating at her mother's in New York. Roxanne had gathered from Geoffrey that Harry's wife was not as attractive as Harry. Geoffrey had met her once and considered her shallow. But Harry had been married nearly two years and was apparently happy, so Geoffrey guessed that she was probably all right. "'I'm making biscuits,' chattered Roxanne gravely. "'Can your wife make biscuits? The cook is showing me how. I think every woman should know how to make biscuits. It sounds so utterly disarming.' A woman who can make biscuits can surely do no. You'll have to come out here and live, said Geoffrey. Get a place out in the country like us, for you and Kitty. You don't know Kitty. She hates the country. She's got to have her theaters and vaudevilles. Bring her out, repeated Geoffrey. We'll have a colony. There's an awfully nice crowd here already. Bring her out. They were at the porch steps now, and Roxanne made a brisk gesture toward a dilapidated structure on the right. "'The garage,' she announced. "'It will also be Geoffrey's writing room within the month. Meanwhile, dinner is at seven. Meanwhile to that, I will mix a cocktail.' The two men ascended to the second floor. That is, they ascended halfway, for at the first landing Geoffrey dropped his guest's suitcase, and in a cross between a query and a cry exclaimed, for God's sake, Harry, how do you like her? We will go upstairs, answered his guest, and we will shut the door. Half an hour later, as they were sitting together in the library, Roxanne reissued from the kitchen, bearing before her a pan of biscuits. Geoffrey and Harry rose. They're beautiful, dear, said the husband intensely. Exquisite, murmured Harry. Roxanne beamed. "'Taste one. I couldn't bear to touch them before you'd seen them all, and I can't bear to take them back until I find what they taste like.' "'Like manna, darling.' Simultaneously the two men raised the biscuits to their lips, nibbled tentatively. Simultaneously they tried to change the subject. 
But Roxanne, undeceived, set down the pan and seized a biscuit. After a second, her comment rang out with lugubrious finality. Absolutely bum. Really? Why, I didn't notice. Roxanne roared. Oh, I'm useless, she cried, laughing. Turn me out, Geoffrey. I'm a parasite. I'm no good. Geoffrey put his arm around her. Darling, I'll eat your biscuits. They're beautiful anyway, insisted Roxanne. They're, they're decorative, suggested Harry. Geoffrey took him up wildly. That's the word. They're decorative. They're masterpieces. We'll use them. He rushed to the kitchen and returned with a hammer and a handful of nails. We'll use them, by golly, Roxanne. We'll make a freeze out of them. Don't! wailed Roxanne. Our beautiful house! Never mind. We're going to have the library repapered in October. Don't you remember? Well... Bang! The first biscuit was impaled to the wall, where it quivered for a moment, like a live thing. Bang! When Roxanne returned with a second round of cocktails, the biscuits were in a perpendicular row, twelve of them, like a collection of primitive spearheads. Roxanne, exclaimed Geoffrey, you're an artist. Cook? Nonsense. You shall illustrate my books. During dinner the twilight faltered into dusk, and later it was a starry dark outside, filled and permeated with the frail gorgeousness of Roxanne's white dress and her tremulous, low laugh. Such a little girl she is, thought Harry. Not as old as Kitty. He compared the two. Kitty... Nervous without being sensitive, temperamental without temperament, a woman who seemed to flit and never light, and Roxanne, who was as young as spring night and summed up in her own adolescent laughter. A good match for Geoffrey, he thought again. Two very young people, the sort who'll stay very young until they suddenly find themselves old. Harry thought these things between his constant thoughts about Kitty. He was depressed about Kitty. It seemed to him that she was well enough to come back to Chicago and bring his little son. He was thinking vaguely of Kitty when he said good night to his friend's wife and his friend at the foot of the stairs. "'You're our first real house guest,' called Roxanne after him. "'Aren't you thrilled and proud?' When he was out of sight around the stair corner, she turned to Geoffrey, who was standing beside her, resting his hand on the end of the banister. Are you tired, my dearest? Geoffrey rubbed the center of his forehead with his fingers. A little. How did you know? Oh, how could I help knowing about you? It's a headache, he said moodily. Splitting. I'll take some aspirin. She reached over and snapped out the light, and with his arm tied about her waist, they walked up the stairs together. Chapter 2 Harry's week passed. They drove about the dreaming lanes, or idled in cheerful inanity upon lake or lawn. In the evening, Roxanne, sitting inside, played to them, while the ashes whitened on the glowing ends of their cigars. Then came a telegram from Kitty, saying that she wanted Harry to come east and get her, so Roxanne and Geoffrey were left alone in that privacy of which they never seemed to tire. Alone thrilled them again. They wandered about the house, each feeling intimately the presence of the other. They sat on the same side of the table like honeymooners. They were intensely absorbed, intensely happy. The town of Marlowe, though a comparatively old settlement, had only recently acquired a society. Five or six years before, alarmed at the smoky swelling of Chicago, two or three young married couples, bungalow people, had moved out. Their friends had followed. The Jeffrey Curtains found an already formed set prepared to welcome them. A country club, ballroom, and golf links yawned for them, and there were bridge parties and poker parties, and parties where they drank beer, and parties where they drank nothing at all. It was at a poker party that they found themselves a week after Harry's departure. There were two tables, and a good proportion of the young wives were smoking and shouting their bets, and being very daringly mannish for those days. Roxanne had left the game early and taken to perambulation. She wandered into the pantry and found herself some grape juice. 
beer gave her a headache, and then passed from table to table, looking over shoulders at the hands, keeping an eye on Geoffrey, and being pleasantly unexcited and content. Geoffrey, with intense concentration, was raising a pile of chips of all colors, and Roxanne knew by the deepened wrinkle between his eyes that he was interested. She liked to see him interested in small things. She crossed over quietly and sat down on the arm of his chair. She sat there five minutes, listening to the sharp, intermittent comments of the men and the chatter of the women, which rose from the table like soft smoke, and yet scarcely hearing either. Then, quite innocently, she reached out her hand, intending to place it on Geoffrey's shoulder. As it touched him, he started of a sudden, gave a short grunt, and sweeping back his arm furiously, caught her a glancing blow on her elbow. There was a general gasp. Roxanne regained her balance, gave a little cry, and rose quickly to her feet. It had been the greatest shock of her life. This, from Geoffrey, the heart of kindness, of consideration, this instinctively brutal gesture. The gasp became a silence. A dozen eyes were turned on Geoffrey, who looked up as though seeing Roxanne for the first time. An expression of bewilderment settled on his face. Why, Roxanne, he said haltingly. Into a dozen minds entered a quick suspicion, a rumor of scandal. Could it be that behind the scenes with this couple, apparently so in love, lurked some curious antipathy? Why else this streak of fire across such a cloudless heaven? Geoffrey! Roxanne's voice was pleading. Startled and horrified, she yet knew that it was a mistake. Not once did it occur to her to blame him or to resent it. Her word was a trembling supplication. Tell me, Geoffrey, it said. Tell Roxanne, your own Roxanne. Why, Roxanne, began Geoffrey again. The bewildered look changed to pain. He was clearly as startled as she. I didn't intend that, he went on. You startled me. You, I felt as if someone were attacking me. I, how, why, how idiotic. Geoffrey. Again the word was a prayer, incense offered up to a high god through this new and unfathomable darkness. They were both on their feet, they were saying good-bye, faltering, apologizing, explaining. There was no attempt to pass it off easily. That way lay sacrilege. Geoffrey had not been feeling well, they said. He had become nervous. Back of both their minds was the unexplained horror of that blow the marvel that there had been, for an instant, something between them, his anger and her fear, and now to both a sorrow, momentary, no doubt, but to be bridged at once, at once, while there was yet time. Was that swift water lashing under their feet, the fierce glint of some uncharted chasm? Out in their car, under the harvest moon, he talked brokenly. It was just incomprehensible to him, he said. He had been thinking of the poker game, absorbed, and the touch on his shoulder had seemed like an attack. An attack! He clung to that word, flung it up as a shield. He had hated what touched him. With the impact of his hand, it had gone, that nervousness. That was all he knew. Both their eyes filled with tears, and they whispered love there under the broad night as the serene streets of Marlowe sped by. Later, when they went to bed, they were quite calm. Geoffrey was to take a week off all work, was simply to loll and sleep and go on long walks until this nervousness left him. When they had decided this, safety settled down upon Roxanne. The pillows underhead became soft and friendly. The bed on which they lay seemed wide and white and sturdy beneath the radiance that streamed in at the window. Five days later, in the first cool of late afternoon, Geoffrey picked up an oak chair and sent it crashing through his own front window. Then he lay down on the couch like a child, weeping piteously and begging to die. A blood clot the size of a marble had broken in his brain. Chapter 3 There is a sort of waking nightmare that sets in sometimes when one has missed a sleep or two 
a feeling that comes with extreme fatigue and a new sun, that the quality of the life around has changed. It is a fully articulate conviction that somehow the existence one is then leading is a branch shoot of life, and is related to life only as a moving picture or a mirror, that the people and streets and houses are only projections from a very dim and chaotic past. It was in such a state that Roxanne found herself during the first months of Geoffrey's illness. She slept only when she was utterly exhausted. She awoke under a cloud. The long, sober voice consultations, the faint aura of medicine in the halls, the sudden tiptoeing in a house that had echoed to many cheerful footsteps, and, most of all, Geoffrey's white face amid the pillows of the bed they had shared. These things subdued her and made her indelibly older. The doctors held out hope, but that was all. A long rest, they said, and quiet. So responsibility came to Roxanne. It was she who paid the bills, poured over his bank book, corresponded with his publishers. She was in the kitchen constantly. She learned from the nurse how to prepare his meals, and after the first month took complete charge of the sick room. She had had to let the nurse go for reasons of economy. One of the two colored girls left at the same time. Roxanne was realizing that they had been living from short story to short story. The most frequent visitor was Harry Cromwell. He had been shocked and depressed by the news, and though his wife was now living with him in Chicago, he found time to come out several times a month. Roxanne found his sympathy welcome. There was some quality of suffering in the man, some inherent pitifulness that made her comfortable when he was near. Roxanne's nature had suddenly deepened. She felt sometimes that with Geoffrey she was losing her children also those children that now, most of all, she needed, and should have had. It was six months after Geoffrey's collapse, and when the nightmare had faded, leaving not the old world, but a new one, grayer and colder, that she went to see Harry's wife. Finding herself in Chicago with an extra hour before train time, she decided, out of courtesy, to call. As she stepped inside the door, she had an immediate impression that the apartment was very like some place she had seen before, and almost instantly she remembered a round-the-corner bakery of her childhood, a bakery full of rows and rows of pink frosted cakes, a stuffy pink, pink as a food, pink triumphant, vulgar, and odious. And this apartment was like that. It was pink. It smelled pink. Mrs. Cromwell, attired in a wrapper of pink and black, opened the door. Her hair was yellow, heightened, Roxanne imagined, by a dash of peroxide in the rinsing water every week. Her eyes were a thin waxen blue. She was pretty and too consciously graceful. Her cordiality was strident and intimate. Hostility melted so quickly to hospitality that it seemed they were both merely in the face and voice, never touching nor touched by the deep core of egotism beneath. But to Roxanne these things were secondary. Her eyes were caught and held in uncanny fascination by the wrapper. It was vilely unclean. From its lowest hem up four inches it was sheerly dirty with the blue dust of the floor. For the next three inches it was gray. Then it shaded off into its natural color, which was pink. It was dirty at the sleeves, too, and at the collar. And when the woman turned to lead the way into the parlor, Roxanne was sure that her neck was dirty. A one-sided rattle of conversation began. Mrs. Cromwell became explicit about her likes and dislikes, her head, her stomach, her teeth, her apartment, avoiding with a sort of insolent meticulousness any inclusion of Roxanne with life, as if presuming that Roxanne, having been dealt a blow, wished life to be carefully skirted. Roxanne smiled. That kimono, that neck. After five minutes, a little boy toddled into the parlor, a dirty little boy clad in dirty pink rompers. His face was smudgy. Roxanne wanted to take him into her lap and wipe his nose. Other parts in the vicinity of his head needed attention. His tiny shoes were kicked out at the toes. Unspeakable. What a darling little boy! exclaimed Roxanne, smiling radiantly. Come here to me. 
Mrs. Cromwell looked coldly at her son. "'He will get dirty. Look at that face.' She held her head on one side and regarded it critically. "'Isn't he a darling?' repeated Roxanne. "'Look at his rompers,' frowned Mrs. Cromwell. "'He needs a change, don't you, George?' George stared at her curiously. To his mind the word rompers connotated a garment extraneously smeared, as this one. "'I tried to make him look respectable this morning,' complained Mrs. Cromwell, as one whose patience had been sorely tried. "'And I found he didn't have any more rompers. So rather than have him go round without any, I put him back in those. And his face—' "'How many pairs has he?' Roxanne's voice was pleasantly curious." "'How many feather fans have you?' she might have asked. "'Oh,' Mrs. Cromwell considered, wrinkling her pretty brow. Five, I think. Plenty, I know. "'You can get them for fifty cents a pair.' Mrs. Cromwell's eyes showed surprise, and the faintest superiority. "'The price of rompers.' "'Can you really? I had no idea. He ought to have plenty, but I haven't had a minute all week to send the laundry out.' Then, dismissing the subject as irrelevant, "'I must show you some things.' They rose, and Roxanne followed her past an open bathroom door, whose garment-littered floor showed, indeed, that the laundry hadn't been sent out for some time, into another room that was, so to speak, the quintessence of pinkness. This was Mrs. Cromwell's room. Here the hostess opened a closet door and displayed before Roxanne's eyes an amazing collection of lingerie. There were dozens of filmy marvels of lace and silk, all clean, unruffled, seemingly not yet touched. On hangers beside them were three new evening dresses. "'I have some beautiful things,' said Mrs. Cromwell, "'but not much of a chance to wear them. Harry doesn't care about going out.' Spite crept into her voice. "'He's perfectly content to let me play nursemaid and housekeeper all day, and loving wife in the evening.' Roxanne smiled again. "'You've got some beautiful clothes here.' "'Yes, I have. Let me show you.' "'Beautiful,' repeated Roxanne, interrupting. "'But I'll have to run if I'm going to catch my train.' She felt that her hands were trembling. She wanted to put them on this woman and shake her, shake her. She wanted her locked up somewhere and set to scrubbing floors. "'Beautiful,' she repeated and I just came in for a moment. Well, I'm sorry Harry isn't here. They moved toward the door. And, oh, said Roxanne with an effort, yet her voice was still gentle and her lips were smiling. I think it's Argyle's where you can get those rompers. Goodbye. It was not until she had reached the station and bought her ticket to Marlowe that Roxanne realized that it was the first five minutes in six months that her mind had been off Geoffrey. End of Part 1